Hello, my name is Eliza Kasoy. I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley working with Professor Allison Gopnik. And today I'm going to tell you about comparing children with agents in unified environments. So in spite of the AI advances that we have, children are by far the best learners we have, learning impressive skills like language and high level reasoning from very little data. And children's learning is supported by highly efficient hypothesis driven exploration. In fact, they explore so well that many machine learning researchers have been inspired to put videos like this one into their talks to motivate research into exploration methods. But this video is often the extent to which such research actually connects with human cognition because applying results from studies in developmental psychology studies to agent design can be really difficult. So today I'll tell you about a few projects I'm working on that aim to create a level playing field for comparing children and artificial agents in various environments. Our first project I'll tell you about today is a collaboration with Deepak Pathak, Polkit Agrawal, Alyosha Efros, and Trevor Darrell. So, is it possible to adapt an environment designed to test the behavior of artificial agents, for example, the DeepMind lab environment for use with real children? We have developed the platform and framework based on DeepMind Lab, which is a first person 3D navigation and puzzle solving environment originally built for testing agents in mazes with rich visuals. Here we have modified it so that it allows us to directly compare the exploration behavior of human children and artificial agents. So this allows us to compare with exactly the same observations and maps. Moreover, this allows us to restrict the action space in DeepMind Lab to four simple actions, forward, backwards, turn left and turn right, using these custom controllers that I built using Arduinos in the lab that make it easier for children to navigate around. So now let's look at our setup. To the very left, you can see what it looks like when a child is exploring the maze using the controller and the four possible actions that they can take. In the middle video, you can see what the child is seeing while navigating through the maze. And here you can see on the right, you can see an aerial view of the child's overall trajectory in the maze, blue representing where they started their exploration and red is where they finished. So our first experiments look to see if children ages four to five that are naturally more curious or exploratory in a given maze, able to succeed at finding a goal in a later maze. So first we, ha uh, we have children explore the maze on the left for three minutes. They are not given any specific instructions or goals or even told how long they have. We cut them off at three minutes and then we take the percentage of the maze that they explored as a curiosity or exploration measure. We then introduce a goal into the same maze, which looks like a squishy little gummy bear and ask children to find this gummy bear. We then time how long it takes them to find the gummy via the number of steps they took to find this goal gummy. For the third part on the right, we block the path to the main goal and measure how quickly the children can readjust to a new map. We break down their percentage of maze explored into one of three groups, low, medium, and high explorers. And what we find is that the less exploring the child did in the first part of the maze, the higher the number of steps it took them to reach the gummy, which you can see in the plot on the left. The y-axis represents the number of steps it took them to find the gummy, and the x-axis represents the explorer type. The data suggests a trend that higher explorers are more efficient at finding a goal in this maze setting. Our preliminary work on project one leads us to project two, which is a collaboration with Jasmine Collins, David Chan, Deepak Pathak, Polkit Agrawal, and Jeffrey Liu. In this experiment, we set out to see how many different reward structures affect how children explore the maze and then search for goals. So our experimental design is as follows. We have two conditions which we call dense or sparse rewards. We want to explore whether having an initial reward path to get to the goal versus free exploration with no rewards affects children's abilities to find a goal in a follow-up maze. So in the sparse rewards condition, which is on the left, you can see an aerial view for the six mazes that the children do. For part one, children freely explore for three minutes. Then in part two, we ask them to find the goal. And in part three, we block the main path to the goal, similar to our first experiment. Then we do the same tasks, but in a novel maze design for a total of six mazes per child. In the dense rewards condition, which you can see on the right of the slide, 
For part one, children are told to follow a path of apples that'll lead them to the goal. Then in part two, we take these apples away and ask them to get to the goal. And in part three, we block the main path to the goal. Then we do the same tasks, but in a novel maze design. We then train and compare the agents in these exact same maze situations. Despite the differences in conditions, we didn't find a statistical difference between the number of steps children are taking and the percentage of maze explored in the different mazes. And to get an understanding of the types of maze exploration done by the children, we cluster their part one trajectories into three groups for each condition. For the dense condition, which is on top, which is the one where they follow the apples, we see that most children follow the path of the apples more or less directly to the goal, groups one and two. But some children go and explore the whole maze regardless, which you can see in group three, which we had eight kids in that group. In the sparse condition, however, we see that in general, the children are exploring more than in the dense condition. So in conclusion, we find that children are spontaneously exploring the mazes in the free exploration conditions, reaching almost all of the maze area. Children who explore more of the maze trend towards being better at finding the goal. And in the dense rewards condition, children cover less of the maze than in the free exploration condition. However, a minority of children continue to explore wildly. Children perform equally well in the goal-directed condition when they have freely explored or when they have followed the dense reward path. We were also curious to see if between these two conditions, children are paying attention to their surroundings. So we placed an image on the wall, which you can see is this little house near the goal. And after they completed the maze, the first one, we gave them a forced choice to see if they noticed the correct image. What we find is that in the dense rewards condition, children are less likely to see the correct image. They notice it 72% of the time. Where in the sparse rewards condition, they noticed it 100% of the time. The difference between these conditions is significant, meaning that the children, when the children are freely exploring versus focused on finding a goal, they are noticing their surroundings more. Next, we ask how the trajectories of the children compare to different algorithmic approaches for exploring a maze. We compare the children to both random agents and reinforcement learning agents. The random agent picks a direction to walk in the maze and continues along that direction until a junction is reached. At the junction, it samples a new direction at random and then it go, again goes in that direction until the next junction. The random agent, however, doesn't see the apples in the environment the way the children do. So we also compared to a reinforcement learning agent with memory that takes into account the reward structure of our environment, in this case, a positive reward for getting the apples, and selects actions as to maximize its reward. We train the RL agents on a variety of other maze layouts and then evaluate their performance on the same mazes that the children do. Here we can see a summary of the children, random agent, and RL agents trajectories for part, part one in the dense rewards condition. So the bar charts show percentage of the maze explored, percentage of the maze re-explored or visited more than once, and percent branched. Percent branched measures the amount of times that the child or agent takes a branch at a junction versus continuing to go straight. In general, we find that the random agent explored more of the maze than the children and the RL agent. And this makes sense because the random agent is blind to the reward structure, here are the apples present in the maze. On the other hand, the paths of the children and RL agent are more biased to where the apples are in the maze, and we can see this in the corresponding heat maps. Meanwhile, the heat maps for the random agent shows exploration that is more dispersed across the entire maze, Qualitatively, we can see that children's trajectories in this condition look more like the RL agent than a random agent. So now I'm gonna talk about my next project, which is project three. And this is a project I started back when I was in Josh's lab. And this is a collaboration with Masha and Charlie, Kelsey, Josh, and Brendan Lake. This work is inspired by Brendan Lake's work on the Omniglot data set and challenge. And our new data set of children's letters is available for download on GitHub if you want to play around with it. So I'd like to present this new data set that I'm calling Omniglot Junior. And over the past couple of years, I've collected a lot, of, a lot of data and made this data set of children drawing letters, ages three, the children are ages three to six, and they draw letters from the original Omniglot data set on an iPad app that preserves their stroke data as CSV files and can easily recreate these images and videos, as you can see here. I asked children to both draw letters and classify them in a four-way classification task, similar to what Brendan did in his original work. So here are some examples of children's letters. 
As you can see, the children do a decent job attempting to recreate the letters that they have been presented with for the first time and are capturing what seems to be the essence of the letter, but their lack of motor control seems to be preventing them from truly creating perfect letters. And if you look at some here, for example, you can see like the pieces of the letters are there, but definitely the motor control is preventing them from making them look really nice. So we also find that compared to adults, children are using more strokes per letter on average. On the left, you can see that the frequency at which adults use and number of strokes per letter and the children are on the right. Here at the top, you can see an example classific uh, classification question. And this classification challenge was designed by Kelsey Allen at MIT. And the model is trained to do classification of the characters from the training set. The model is basically using prototypical networks from Brendan's Omniglot challenge paper using the distances in the embedding space. So the questions are purposefully challenging. The results of the classification were much higher than we predicted with chance being at 25%. Children were presented with 24 four-way classification questions. They had either drawn the letter in the first part of the task or it was completely novel. In the questions where they had drawn the letter once, they achieved a an accuracy score of 78%. In the questions where the letter was completely novel, the children scored 70% accuracy and children tended to do better with age. We take the children's data and train the BPL model. What we then find is that the model trained on only children's letters generated examples that look better than the children's letters. So on the left, you can see the children's letters and on the right, you can see what the model generated. And this tells us that the children are generating the correct primitives, enough for the model to generate such nice looking letters, which suggests that extracting the correct information about the letter, which um, when they attempt to draw them, but their physical lack of motor control is getting in the way. And this begs the question, can we create a model that can generate childlike letters and even classify them? We also tried to tweak some of the hyperparameters in the model, but the letters still look too good to have been generated by children. We hope to be able to find a model that can generate and classify childlike letters. There are great models out there that can just generate and great classification models, but is there one that could really achieve childlike behavior on both tasks? In conclusion, this work only begins to touch on a number of deep questions regarding how children and agents explore. The two experiments or the three experiments presented here touch on questions of how much children and agents are willing to explore, whether free versus goal-directed exploration strategies differ, and how reward shaping affects exploration. Yet our setup allows us to ask so many more and we have concrete plans to do so. For example, how are kids affected by distractors? For example, how will they react to the famous noisy TV problem? Or what is the effect of memory in the maze task? For example, how can children and agents integrate memory over time? And does valence of reward affect exploration in any way? Thank you for tuning in and a huge thank you to all my collaborators, especially my PI, Alison Gopnik, who makes all of this possible. And as you can see here, is always willing to demo all our crazy environments. Thank you.